with themselves. Let me start uh, with Lieutenant General Dr. S.P. Kocher. He's a recipient of multiple awards during the 39 years of services in the Corps from where he retired as a signal officer in chief in 2013. He was then the first CEO of Telecom Sector Skill Council for six years. Sir, we'll need more of this. So we've just talked about that in the earlier panel. Uh, currently, he's been the DG of COAI for the last three years. During these years, he has been, he's held board level positions in prestigious universities and corporates. So while the long career and an army man to the core, he's had a very short introduction. Next, uh, Pratyush Kumar. Pratyush is the pre-sales VP uh, India for Sergon, and he's also a 5G global expert. With over 20 years of experience in telecom industry, Pratyush has been supporting global sales and delivering value to service providers and mission-critical private networks worldwide. He has vast global experience in all possible segments of wireless transmission, be it field, planning, product, pre-sales, post-sales, including techno-commercial, and has driven and supported hundreds of vast green and brown field, 2G, 3G, 5G, and uh, 4G and 5G network projects. I'm already skipping the 4G now, so pardon me for that. His expertise lies in understanding customer challenges and offering designed innovative solutions that best address their needs and provide optimal business value. I have Sachin, Sachin Arora. He's the head of Mobile Security Division, India for Giseke and Debrian. Uh, Sachin, I hope I pronounced that okay. Yeah, it's it's very difficult. If you see this name, I'm sure you're going to find it difficult. But Sachin is currently leading the mobile security, uh, the telecom division in uh, GND MS India. He's responsible for division business PNL and also the management board member in India. He's associated with GND for the last 10 years and has worked in various business segments in various countries. Uh, last but not the least, I have Anut Siddharth. He's the Deputy Director for Marketing and Communications at MediaTek. Anuj is an integrated marketing and communication specialist with almost two decades of experience. Since joining MediaTek in 2008, Siddharth has taken an innovative approach to building recognition for MediaTek among industry leaders, media, and consumer. He leads the corporate marketing initiative in India and Middle East. Uh, sorry, Middle East and, and Europe as well. So... Mia, I wanted to say, but sometimes it gets confusing because there's so many terms. People use Mina, we have Misa, uh, in KPMG, Mia. So, okay, I'll dive into the questions. Uh, and uh, General Kocha, if I may start with you, sir. Affordability and accessibility are always seen as complementary, but somehow they are also the biggest challenges faced in the seamless adoption of 5G. What do you think? And I, why I'm starting with the key challenges is so that then we can try and see how what are the solutions that the rest of the panelists can suggest? What do you think are the key challenges that you see under these heads for the ecosystem at large, right? Where we can, you know, the entire ecosystem and for telcos in particular, because finally the job is on them. You know, that's where uh, you, you also obviously come in to make this happen on an accelerated basis, sir. Great. That's a, that's a very wide question. See, the ecosystem at large as you say, and as the Honorable Prime Minister said, is going to benefit if we have a sound telecom system. And therefore, your question reduces to how can we help the telecom system be more affordable and accessible. So, General of the Army has to overlook everything. <laughs> so, uh, it has to be wide for you. <laughs> so, I look at the ecosystem in four parts. One is building the networks. The networks have to be robust and they have to be sustainable. The second part is after having, <clears throat> after having built the networks, we have to see how we can create platforms on which we can run applications and take it to the subscribers. Third, we have to see that the subscribers have affordable devices on which they can use these applications. And the last one is, how can the subscribers benefit maximum where skilling is required? So let me, let me touch on each one of them separately. The build robust networks in 5G, uh, we, we require a huge amount of capex. And without any indication of when the ROI will come. 
at this point of time world over nobody can say when the roi is going to come so therefore the government has to start looking at the manner in which they charge for building blocks of these networks specifically the uh, the spectrum charges the fees and levies things of that nature so that cannot be at the scales at which they were charging for 4g so therefore if we have to have robust networks government has to reduce all these prices considering that robust networks are essential they are no longer a luxury and having said they are essential we also got up in a situation where there is no going to be no roi for some times to come right so this is as far as the networks is concerned and in addition government has to become enabling for for rolling out the network which they are doing but we would we would require more accelerated pace it has caught up to be fair to them second what is about platforms now tsps cannot continue relying only on network rollouts and uh, and uh, the revenues they earn from tariffs from subscribers what they will have to get into is different lines of business related lines of business and these related lines of business i say uh, will be after network rollout they will bring in platforms and those platforms may be owned by the tsps themselves or may be owned by any third party so it's a separate business unit and on top of this business unit will come offerings of application providers who will host their application on these platforms and these application will reach the subscribers and the subscribers will have to be skilled skilled enough to use these applications after getting an affordable device so we have to we have to look at these four pillars to see that everything is is uh, kept affordable and timely and this happens so this is the ecosystem i see evolving and this is uh, these are three different uh sbus which are going to come up in same companies and they will be treated separately maybe under different regulation different policies the policies which are application on network provisioning sbu will be the policies that we deal with today the policies that are uh, going to be applicable on platforms maybe something which are today applicable on it platforms and uh, even even the even the tsps who host platforms may be subject to those new policies and regulations and the third of course is uh, for application provisioning uh, they come in a different realm but all of them have to jointly sit together and see that they share the burden as well as the benefits today the thing is the way things are evolving and i see you smiling uh, the way things are evolving there are too many people who who load the network which humongous amount of traffic and don't pay anything for it right and then comes a red herring which says oh tsp is asking us for fair share they are destroying the startup ecosystem on the contrary we are committed that we will we are not including the startup ecosystem in the large traffic generators the ltgs it is only four or maximum five companies who are mnc's who are who are generating this huge amount of data and who whom we are asking to come and share give us a fair share so that we can maintain we can set up and maintain the networks on which they are riding and they making profits huge amount of profits on that so this in a nutshell is what i'd like to say so why i was smiling there are two reasons and you caught me there one is this exact point was brought up in the earlier panel from a telco operator's perspective obviously they are the ones who put in the the entire investment and someone else is taking the cream off and it's fair to say that how can we divide that fair share but the other thing why i thought you know what you were bringing out was extremely important is that the way you are dividing it right if you are slicing it into three parts the question the way we have been wired as economists as uh, people who commercially agree on how the allocation should be the first question going to be roi return on investment 
Who has gone the biggest investment? It's always the network, right? So the person who will bear the, or what we call the dumb network, if I may say so without any offense, will bear the biggest burden, but never get the return. So we have to also change the way we look at how we're going to be allocating the capital. I think that's going to be extremely important. Capital resources, whichever way you look at it. So thank you. I, and I understand without giving the challenges, you've talked a lot more about the challenges. So thank you for that. Sachin, if I may come to you, given these challenges, let me bring you in and get your views on something that's gaining significant traction as a commercial case for 5G, right? Which is really the private uh, or let's say uh, local networks. So in industrial sectors, campus and private 5G or LTE networks are expected to be one of the commercially feasible use cases for 5G deployment. These as such offer improved digitization, security and efficiency. So then what impedes the accelerated deployment? Does affordability still pose the challenge and what do you see as the solution? Okay, so just in continuation of General Kosher statements and your ROI statement, See, the 4G wave came in and that was actually a boon for the consumer segment, like people like us uh, who are using the 4G services and our operators like the private operators, all three. The ROI stuff basically when we are talking about, as of today with the understanding, there is not much of the ROIs coming to the MNOs for the 5G segment. And that is clear. Now this 5G and the future this will be coming from the enterprises. The IoT use cases we are talking about, the enterprise segment we are talking about, that has always been unaddressed. And even if we keep aside, if someone has a thought, okay, it has not been unaddressed, but it has not been utilized so far from the normal cellular connectivity, but the IoT or the enterprise mode called M2MAV, that will bring the real ROIs. And as you asked for the Shop it for the uh, private networks. See, this is one of the use case as a commercial segment which will be prominent in the future like the other Western countries are already adopting it. In the auction, if you remember, MS Adani, means the, the company Adani, they wait for the private networks for their utilization and the, the purpose. So if the use case is there, there will be utilization of those networks or those use cases. And that the commercialization will come in where the small companies, so Adani could afford, but there are various companies which will not be going into that direction. And there comes the MNO play where they will go into the, seg into the private premises and say, I set up the network for you and you just give me the money and I maintain for it, just complete outsourcing. And then the various topics come up, various use cases come up into that segment. Now when you talk about the affordability, I talked about two segments. One is we are talking about the affordability part uh, from the consumer side and from the M2M also to the enterprise side. In the affordability of the 5G, my opinion would be that it gradually becomes affordable with the time. That's the one of the part, very basic sense. So, where you're talking about economies of scale. From that the economies by, by default only Absolutely. Number jata hai ki that exactly. it obviously gets accepted. So it gets penetrated automatically. Then you don't need to think about. Right. But if you're trying to impose India as a very different country, so to say, from the ARPU point of view also, right? One of the least ARPU and the best data packages uh, in, in, in India I means everyone gets surprised and shocked when they hear about, especially from the Western country. So, so from the affordability point of view, it's, it's obviously the handsets come in later stage, but the most important topic comes up, what the MNOs, the network operators are looking for, what kind of ROI, or they are okay to wait for a certain year or certain, you know, certain certain years maybe. Yeah? But when we talk about just the last statement on my side on this one, then the affordability from the commercial segment, I would say that it is not about the affordability, it's the need of the enterprise then. Because if there would be need for the enterprise where they are talking about the 5G cases with the advantages of their low latency, high speed and data security and putting into their own home, so to say, in their private, in their own privacy, then they would for, they will surely go for it. Then it's not about the affordability. They would say, I need the use case, you come here to the MNO and just deploy it and I pay you the money. But then the use case, what they will be looking for, that will bring the value for that enterprise. 
and that would bring the roi to the enterprise and also to the mno because they are getting the money from the enterprise segment now so what you're saying is it's not the question of affordability it's the question of demonstration of the use case and the value for the enterprise exactly. the value addition should be there if the enterprise would not really ask for any value addition they would not really go for any use case or private network or anything else so adani did means as a personal opinion nothing as such but they they are the large conglomerate from india right means but now they so you can imagine after two years when they will be ready with their private networks just imagine that you are in this adani jabalpur and then they are sitting in adani chennai somewhere and you are keeping your data sick the in, in a private mode and then everything is in in your control so to say regardless of the dependency of other mnos the results they will bring in predictive maintenance they are talking about they are talking about the the optimization of the services they are talking about the cost saving stuff so that use case where the end results will come into the play and that's how the in the private networks and the roi for the mnos will come into the future well they have been facing some headwinds of late but hopefully this will all come through um, and i am I'm, i'm not you know particularly focusing on them i'm saying it's we have to see the crystal gaze at uh, at the end of two years so hopefully yes thank you for bringing that uh, such in pratyush if i may you know move to you and this is a question that we've used in the earlier panel also but i think it's important that you also pine on this you know deployment of 5g is not only about high end it is also about serving the underserved in you know, rural areas we have a lot of mountains right and it is a line of sight issue open waters we have i don't know how many thousand kilometers of coastline and the territorial boundaries extend within the waters as well so how do you see you know this from a 5g perspective i'll slightly go back you know uh, we are talking about 5g but i'll slightly go back when we actually understood the requirement of connectivity so uh, during covid days before covid days you know you used to work from office uh, everybody used to go to school colleges you know internet is connectivity is there but during uh, covid when there was a complete lockdown uh, you have to work from home so you have to work from uh, work from home learn from school, learn from home so there everybody understood the requirement of the connectivity a stable broadband connectivity thank you for bringing that back us <laughs> you know i no. i remember everyone making a beeline saying the amount of network balancing that they have had to do because the load used to be and time difference yes. also right uh, i know even in power sector that's been a challenge because the loads have shifted it's yes. no longer to the industrial parks it's to the homes anyway sorry for interjecting i so, i, so I couldn't help the, resist so that I was think. the reason basically that was a time uh, everybody thought that okay, it's not like connectivity is only in the offices we need the connectivity everywhere Uh, so when we talk about connectivity uh, of course like uh, in uh, areas where uh, we have stable connectivity you know everybody was enjoying like if they have uh, computers tablet everybody everything was st- the stable internet connectivity but the problem was in the low uh, i'll say with who were unfortunate enough which uh, in rural areas where there was a digital divide and they were unconnected because of various reasons and one of the reason is justified like operators are basically focusing on the areas where it is densely populated or we are paying customers it's justifiable because of the business they're not going to the rural areas so they're not going to places where uh, you know there is no revenue yes of course there are different in- initiatives by the government like uh, obligations like uso and different op- uh, like incentives coming from the government beyond the investment whatever everybody is doing we have to find the ways where to invest right okay so then i'll focus on the connectivity so one is of course you know fiber we have been talking about fiber years and uh, fiber is the traditional traditionally it has been the number one for the connectivity because it has very high capacity reliability and everything is there but the problem when we are talking about 5g is uh, is you know time to market and of course the cost unfortunately like you mentioned about the mountainous regions like open waters laying a fiber is almost next to impossible not only that even in densely populated areas if Very you have to lay the fiber it's almost impossible to take the permissions 
to dig the fiber, to deploy the fiber and activate it, overall, the time it takes, the cost it is, we have to look for another option. So we have the another option with the satellite. It's good, we can be connected. It's slightly easily de deployable. Uh, probably slightly affordable, in, it depends. But the capacity is almost negligible. So, uh, and of course, reliability is the issue. <coughs> Latency is a very big issue. So we cannot have uh, 5G on uh, satellite. We are, you know, we are looking for Leo, op Leo satellite options, but you know, they have sent several satellites, but still, they have a lot of challenges. So we have to look for another option, which is wireless connectivity. So what we are doing is we are providing wireless connectivity over microwave license band frequencies and millimeter wave frequencies, which helps to provide connectivity of uh, any places, like uh, it's mountains, it's forest, it's rural area, it's everything. So what we are doing, we have of, we are offering basically innovative ways, even in license band frequencies, to provide capacity of even 4 Gbps in a single box. Okay, and with millimeter wave frequencies, we are offering radios which have a capacity of 20 Gbps in a point-to-point -point microwave link. So that is a wireless connectivity instead of laying a fiber. You have two terminals which are connected over the air to win 20 Gbps of capacity and latency of around 20 25 microseconds. So this is what we are trying to achieve. But this is basically based on the frequencies at level now. We as a Saragon, we are basically you know aiming to reach push the boundaries. And with the next generation chipsets, we are targeting to provide capacities of even 100 Gbps. So there was a time when we were targeting 100 Mbps, 200 Mbps. Now we are targeting to achieve the capacity of 100 Gbps. Broadband was defined at 256 Kbps. Yes. So we, <laughs> I don't even think it's a leapfrog. It's a, <laughs> we have jumped oceans here. So, so. Uh, this is exactly what we are targeting to do. Uh, but the benefit of a microwave, a wireless connectivity, uh, is not only capacity, which is of course one of the need of 5G in a denser uh, urban area, but the other is basically to reach remote areas, mountain areas. We have one of the longest point-to-point uh, -point single link in the world of 241 kilometers, single link. But that, how do you manage the curvature of the earth? It's only one terminal is here. One That's patented and classified. Yes. <laughs> okay. So this is, you know, one of the longest links, single link. You you can believe if you have to lay the fiber of 241 kilometers, you forget it. And that too in a mountainous areas. Apart from this, you mentioned one of the other topics is open waters. So uh, we have uh, our own uh, design innovative idea of gyro stabilized antenna. What we do even when the vessel is on the sea and it's shaking, still we can have a uh, exactly pointed connectivity between two terminals. So even if you are in open, open waters, we can provide the connectivity of one Gbps, two Gbps. So that's the idea that Saragon is pushing the boundaries to provide connectivities even in rural areas, uh, for very high capacity in urban areas, in mountains to reach where nobody can reach, and even in waters to provide connectivity. Super. No, th uh, thanks, Patyush. Anuj, uh, let me just shift to you. Um, in all of this affordability, accessibility, advancement, innovation is going to be key, right? And you guys are at the forefront of some of the things that you're doing. So. You know, as 5G continues to advance, like we had 3G, 3G+, plus, then we have 4G, 4G+, plus, plus, plus. Similarly, we are going to transit into 6G. What are the key tech innovations that MediaTek has introduced to ensure accessibility and high performance of 5G? Because innovation will be expensive initially, but as you get economies of scale, I guess it all evens out. But how do you respond to something like that? Certainly. <clears throat> So well, um, I would say uh, chips are basically the heart of uh, you know most of the devices, and as we all understand, we can't see the heart, but heartbeats are always important, right? So 
uh, that is what I would like to add here. And end of the day, uh, accessibility, yes, uh, in terms of various aspects, you know, uh, uh, you know, our co-panelists they covered about uh, you know a lot of use cases. You know, of course, uh, you know the, the telco, the networks, you know, certainly have to available last mile. And very interesting to know the the water stories, you know, <laughs> from the co-panelists, right? I, I, re I mean, we really wonder, you know, how we get such kind of a great connectivity across, uh, yeah. And of course, um, uh, you know, with that of a lot of uh, interesting, uh, you know, IoT business cases, what Sachin also talked about, right? They're, they're really, really important, uh, uh, you know, from the perspective. Uh, but at MediaTek, we uh, always believe in, in in bringing the best of the technology, best of the connectivity, which certainly has to be in a form of a last mile uh, device, right? So that's when, uh, you know, smartphones, they play a really, really important uh, role today, right, in terms of uh, communication. Of course, you know, there are a lot of other devices, a lot of other, uh, you know, interesting uh, business cases, right, which are there, you know, in terms of adoption to, uh, to 5G, right. Uh, but the most important point here is that, uh, you know, we understand uh, that it's really, really important, uh, you know, for, uh, for an end user to experience the smartphone with best kind of uh, applications, with the best kind of uh, support, you know, because um, I'm sure, you know, all the audience sitting out here, you know, um, you know, how many of you love the camera in your smartphone? You know, how many of you, right? Yeah, how many I, of you... If I may say, it's no longer love, it's a need. If <laughs> you don't need, have right? a camera in the smartphone, it's I'm a, sorry, it's, it's a, not it's a, a smartphone. It's a need of an hour, right? So, be it, uh, be it a camera experience, how many of you do gaming, right? Uh, I'm sure some of you would do that, right? And so and so forth, you know, talk about any kind of application, you know, today, uh, any kind of feature, we may talk about a smartphone. So, whether, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's from a mainstream segment, I would say, or whether it's from a premium segment or flagship segment, right? So, we need to be providing all these kind of advancements in the devices, you know. So, that's when MediaTek is uh, always on the forefront. And, uh, you know, uh, with, we are having uh, MediaTek Dimensity 5G based smartphone solutions, you know, which are actually empowering this ecosystem. Uh, you know, we do have uh, different series, of course, I'm not getting into those product segments, but yes, we are uh, catering to all those segments and keeping in mind that, uh, you know, for an end user, uh, you know, all these parameters are really, really important. Uh, from the connectivity point of view, from the overall experience point of view. So yes, uh, we are always innovating and, uh, you know, making the uh, affordability in mind, catering to main segment and uh, furthermore talking about the mainstream to that of uh, the, the most flagship based products, you know, which are uh, also available powered by MediaTek. Moving from smartphone, this is just an example here, you know, um, I would probably move to the next category, uh, you know, uh, gentlemen, they talked about uh, the connectivity, right? So we, we talked about uh, the CPEs, right? Uh, I mean, 5G CPEs are so important, right, uh, today, right? So, you know, catering to that particular requirement also, again, you know, we need, we always need a last mile solution, right? We always need an end product, right? So yes, uh, so at MediaTek, we are, uh, you know, working uh, tirelessly uh, to come out with the best R&D and uh, keeping in mind the affordability here as well. Of course, you know, catering to the different demands, you know, uh, you know, how severe is the need may be. So yes, uh, so move on from, uh, you know, smartphones uh, to CP routers. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, we foresee futuristic approach, you know, in terms of a uh, lot of industry applications, right, uh, which we even today heard uh, by our PM as well, you know, uh, be it uh, education sector, be it agricultural sector, be it healthcare, you know, and what not all we can think about today, right. So catering uh, to the complete requirement of this ecosystem, you know, MediaTek is at the forefront, uh, you know, keeping always in mind that it is really, really important, uh, uh, you know, to bring best of the technology. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Anuj. Um, Sachin, I'll switch gears. And why I'm switching gears is because I think security is going to be a very, very important aspect of all of this. But with security has to be also affordability. The security and the eSIM concept. So with the iPhone, at least some of you might have heard about the or the understood about the eSIM concept, right? Means that has been pushed by the Apple as a as a first one. And in the last year, in 2022, even they pushed uh, only eSIM iPhones in Americas, and I can tell you the most uh, highest penetration of iPhones uh, for sure means uh, it's being demanded in the US. Uh, now, if they come with the concept of the eSIM in terms of the security, either the private networks or we talk about consumer segments or the M2M segments. The physical SIMs consume a lot of space and don't give that kind of flexibility what eSIM gives in. And one of the biggest advantage, the concept is about the security. They come embedded, they are tempered proof, 
and they are easily to configure with the profiles of the operator you like. Today you are using a subscription of say X, say Airtel or Zio or Vodafone. You can switch immediately say one day, one hour to the other operator. Now with the concept of the security part, if you gradually see lot of companies now, I'm sure here also a lot of companies are talking about the ESG measures. The government is also talking about ESG measures. IoT comes with a lot of advantages and also come with a lot of disadvantages and everything has pros and cons. Similarly, now SIM card, which you are using, it comes with a lot of plastic. From the climate, from the ESG point of view, everyone looking at the sustainability. eSIM brings in the concept from the sustainability, interoperability and security point of view. I give you the idea and maybe our co-panelists here can also contribute and our audience also. If you look at the perspective of the security, say an example, private network we just recently talked about. Can you imagine that you are setting up a private network and you go into that private network, can you latch there? Is it possible? For sure, no. So how do you manage all these things? In the private network, it's much easier that if you have the kind of the eSIM management solutions, you go over there, you scan a QR code, you get latched into the network and then it gives you the secured connectivity. It gives you a clear identity. And now we come to the M2M segment with the eSIM, for example. When you talk of Shopit about security, the eSIM gives you the identity. Like your handset gives you IMI number. The eSIM also gives you the identity. And it's much easier, especially in the cases like private network or the enterprise M2M cases or IoT use cases, where you can decide even whether this device is going to latch into my network or not. Is it secure or not? And that security comes in with these kind of solutions when we talk about. And this is how the evolvement of the SIM card is taking place. And now we are already talking about 6G. I can tell you 6G will be talking more about iSIM. General Coacher can comment more on it. But iSIM will, 6G will be coming more on the iSIM gradually. Because then everything is inserted into the chipset even. So the security concept is the most basic and unavoidable need of any of the new solution or any of the new hardware because with the data increasing day by day the more vulnerabilities are there everywhere means it's not about the the mnos we are talking about we are talking about each and every industry today that is the reason and that's here the connectivity as we are talking about the the eSIM gives you that kind of scalability also for example, you are sitting here, you, you are in the private network, you expand this, remove the wall and then you have the, you are scaling at the horizontal level. You are expanding, but how are you integrating and how are you also climbing the ladder with the vertical integration of the SIM cards when it is increasing? It's not possible if you don't have that kind of solutions at place, that kind of security at place. And that's where we, you know, talk about the security. Now the last statement here on this one. In general, if you think about, is there any difference in terms of the security of the physical SIM card and the eSIM card? The answer is no. The Even it's more prominent in the eSIM because even the SIM is already inserted in your handset. You don't need to think about it. Physical SIM still can be taken out, can be used in other phones by, by the you know unknown users, but embedded SIM is you, your identity, like your handset. So that SIM, that AID becomes your identity. And that's how it make, makes more secure for the future, more sustainable growth of the, of the earth, so to say, when you are avoiding the plastic. But I can tell you as a last closing statement on this one. eSIM penetration will take time. When you talk about the affordability part, should be the last one. The eSIM phones in India are still costlier. Our other OEMs, are, the last panelists, for example, they were talking about. The affordability we are talking about in India is not from the middle class or upper middle class. The penetration of the phones is in the rural tier three cities coming up. And where the smartphones penetration coming up, but if you are talking about the eSIMs, then it becomes a bit of unaffordable because that kind of costings level are high because you need to you need to bring some components put into the phone and that increase the costing part. But gradually we see 
the future in the consumer segment when we call as as a we call as so to say the phone segment it will come for sure it might take 2 3 years but e-sim will be the real future when the mnos will be um, flourishing with the kind of the requirements of these in from the oems also so that's how we see the future you know already sure sachin thanks thanks for bringing that out you you touched upon esg right and sustainability so i i'm going to I, i'll not quiz you further i'll i'll go to pratyush there uh, pratyush sustainability of wireless solutions how can we blend that with affordability so uh, sachin does the point of sustainability uh, in terms of moving from chipsets or uh, sim based chipsets to e sim since uh, we have devices that are uh, placed in the network to provide connectivity so it's very important for us to focus on sustainability in general if we talk about sustainability everybody wants a clean air clean atmosphere uh, clean neighborhood and everybody is ready to do a bit to make those changes but the problem comes when you, know, you have to uh, follow the government regulations uh, legislations and to comply all these requirements because then what happens you know the overall cost of the business is increasing and uh, you limit growth okay so globally basically what is happening like uh, europe is targeting to have uh, 55% deduction compared to their 2000 uh, compared to 1990 levels of reducing their gas emissions uh us is less which is targeting to have 50% deduction compared to 2005 levels well bharat is focusing on uh, around 45% deduction uh, compared to 2005 levels by 2030 okay so the tsp csps isps and private networks are bound to uh, start working on it okay and they have started facing the challenge so i'll focus on the key considerations that we are doing to provide this uh, ecological uh, no uh, planet okay which is ready for tomorrow so i'll i'll put few considerations that we are focusing on so one is uh, low power consumption mm -hmm. you know uh, there was there was a time when you know uh, the automotive industry moved from uh, gas guzzling muscle, muscle cars to fuel efficient vehicles so this is exactly what we are doing we are focusing on very very low power consumption ratios okay because it helps to reduce the carbon footprint and to conserve it second is basically size you have to make devices as small as possible because if you have smaller size you will use raw, less raw materials so you have less production cost like we are moving towards e sim or you are moving towards removing it but we cannot remove the boxes so we are trying to make it as small as possible so less raw material less production cost uh, and not only this basically we need less packing material less space on cargo trucks ships so you save energy during transit i am loving this part because it's not only about the devices and sustainability it's also about supply chain management exactly. so that's two parts in one you will get two prizes for this pratyush thank you <laughs> and not only this basically when you have a small size in general the concept is if you have a small size the power consumption is low and uh, even on the telecommunication tower when i we talk about telecommunication towers for uh, indus for indus or maybe any towers you need small compact devices because in some way like in india we are not paying a lot in terms of we fix for uh, fixed prices for putting one box or whatever but if you go to let's say a us or uh, maybe western countries you pay depend on the number of boxes what you are putting on the tower so then if there are, if it is compact device you pay less so you reduce your operational cost and of course you are saving energy and it also aids affordability of of the obvious so we spoke about low power consumption we spoke about uh, size now let's talk about the unique features that we bring we said again are offering features like advanced space diversity okay which actually reduces uh, the equipment <coughs> by 25% <coughs> so if you have let's say four equipments on the tower we reduce by one third so you have the 75% of the equipment on the tower so less shipping cost of course as you mentioned uh, less raw material less devices and obviously uh, less power consumption because you know we have less so 25% less uh, equipment on the tower so we, this is one of the unique features that we are bringing 
Not only this, basically, now we are slightly moving towards next steps. Okay, this is basically the basic stuff that we have been doing. So next step is basically, you know, uh, if you remember the days when we were young and you know uh, we used to go off from the room and the uh, light is on. Believe me, no one in this entire room thinks that they are getting older. Everyone thinks we are getting younger. No, so I'm, don't <laughs> say that when we were young, we are still young. <laughs> I know. I'm talking about the days when we were, you know, in the school, and you know, we don't uh, care about switching on the off the light. And then on those days, what used to happen, the dad used to come or father used to come to switch off the light because it's not used. Because we have, they have to, they want to save energy even in those days. So this is one of the few, few things what we are trying to do. So we have our intelligent uh, unified system, management system, which understands that if there is no traffic, you just switch off the Power camera. down. You just switch off the camera. Okay. Like in uh, night hours, like in, during the office areas. Because in office uh, office areas, normally the consumption is more in the daytime. So the night hours just reduce it by half automatically without any manual inter uh, intervention. And then you, you reduce basically 50% power consumption. So that's a big saving that we're doing. Okay. So uh, this is one of the unique features of what we're doing. But we're going to the next step now. And what we're doing is basically Normally, to power up a network element, uh, there is a huge energy, there's huge uh, heat that is radiated from the box. And it is so much that the casing of the box is designed in such a way to radiate the heat outside from the box so that the sensitive components are not burned out. So what we're doing is, what if we want to capture this heat and switch it and power it, you know, use it back to a usable power? So we don't want to radiate the heat outside, we want to capture it and use it as a usable power. So these are the few innovative ideas, a few innovative uh, techniques uh, that we are aiming to provide sustainability. And uh, you know, it will help to have a, a network, you know, future network which is green you know, in terms of, uh, let's say, less carbon footprint, more energy efficient, and of course green friendly. Super. I, uh, we'll probably have some people ask you on that sure. heat regeneration. You know, this reminds me of the combined cycle power plants using the reuse of steam. But uh, Anuj, I'll come to you very quickly, you know, and this is something that's talked about earlier in the discussions about uh, educating the masses about the technology inside, because you can only discover, you can only utilize when you're aware and awareness comes with education. So. What is it that you think, you know, the education of the masses about the tech inside the smartphone, especially in context of accessibility and affordability from a 5G perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, firstly, you know, a lot of interesting, uh, you know, co-panelists are talking about, I wanted to interrupt, but yes, it's, uh, you know, I mean, uh, we cannot be doing that. Uh, yeah, some of some of the areas, uh, you know, before I get into, uh, you know, uh, you know, educating the masses, it's, it's really, really important. Um, why? Because, uh, you know, um, it's it's our key responsibility, um, you know, at MediaTek uh, or as a technology provider to the world that uh, we must, uh, you know, come out and run the programs which we are doing uh, currently, uh, be it educating our retailers, uh, be it be running uh, B2B programs such as, uh, you know, uh, uh, educating them using e-commerce channels or uh, be it other kind of innovative programs, you know, wherein we are educating media or educating the uh, the uh, the key influencers to talk about uh, what technology uh, you know MediaTek is providing, so as end user can certainly today take a, a, a completely uh, a, a complete decision you know based on the information available today you know uh, so you know be be it could be any feature be it could be uh, you know any any kind of other technology what they are uh, connectivity in the devices what they are looking forward for. So our aim is always to, uh, you know, demystify the technology, uh, you know, for the masses, so as, uh, you know, they can take, end of the day, informed decision, you know, when it comes to the technology part, you know. 
Well, uh, uh, moving from here, I would also, you know, we are, we are touch basing a lot of uh, interesting topics here, uh, you know, points are coming out, right? We talked about uh, the small size of the device, right? Uh, we also mentioned about, you know, a lot of integration happening in, in the device as well, yeah? So certainly, even at MediaTek also, we are working in the similar direction, you know, wherein uh, size of a chipset is getting reduced, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, as the, the tech is evolving, you know? Uh, we we we, st we used to talk about probably 20 nanometers technology to that of 30 nanometer and today you know we are talking about 4 nanometer of technology right uh, small in size and of course uh, you know better power efficient devices and what not all right in fact uh, we recently you know launched our 3 nanometer technology as well so as uh, you know the technology is evolving and, and and also today we heard from a pm technology is the best way uh, you know to to bring more awareness to bring more connectivity to bring more uh, intelligence in, in any of the uh, you know uh, countries for uh, you know uh, for the for the human being around right so yes uh, so end of the day i would like to add here that uh, you know uh, being talk uh, talking about sustainability as well you know even at MediaTek, you know, we are coming out with the solutions, you know. Uh, sustainability is really, really important factor here. So, you know, even at IMC also, we are demonstrating two-wheeler IoT-based solution, you know, uh, you know, which is empowering a lot of two-wheelers, EV, EV wheelers, you know, uh, with a lot of information on the screens itself, you know, which would not only talk about the battery life, uh, you know, we also need connectivity. So GPS would be there, infotainment would be there, right? So we are also, you know, working tirelessly to bring the best of the technology and of course, you know, keeping always in mind accessibility and affordability, the latest of the advancements in the technology, you know, uh, which is available, it could be in any form factors today. Yeah. Super. Thanks, Anuj. General Kocha, may I thank you for being patient. I know we've come to you, but this is probably the last of the, um, the question and answer round. Looking ahead, sir. Given the advancements and tech, 6G is beckoning on the horizon. What would be your counsel right, for us to actually correct today or at least lay the path today so that when we start looking at 6G, the adoption, the standards, some of these challenges about seamless adoption can actually be eased off rather than revisiting that entire cycle and coming back on the same path. So what are the key things that we should do, regulatory perspective, education perspective, skilling perspective, and the adoption perspective? You know, when I was going around, I was talking to somebody, and uh, he said, uh, look at the series of Gs that have come. 1G, 2G, and up to 5G. I, I thought Gs were only at our home. Sunye Ji. I was finished. So, he brought a very interesting uh, analysis. He says, all the odd Gs didn't last long. The even Gs lasted. 1G to 2G, 1G didn't last, 2G lasted. 3G came in, didn't last, 4G came. 5G has come in, I hope that prophecy... <laughs> yeah. I'll use that line, sir. <laughs> okay, the reason for that is not far to see. Whenever we've gone into a new technology with a new G, we've had bedding problems, setting, settling in problems. And by the time we settle in with that technology, a newer mm -hmm. version comes up. Newer version, not uh, a new technology. Not, not a new technology, yeah. right. So this is what is happening with 5G also. When we, when we went into 5G with a lot of aspirations, it is because we were getting into a newer technology, not an upgrade of 4G. But when we go into 6G, we'll be going into an upgrade of 5G. So technology-wise, we would have resolved most of the issues uh, that are there. Rollout-wise, we would be ready. It'll be a few elements which will have to be changed. It's like, it, take example of 3G to 4G, not too many things changed. I anticipate that is what is going to happen. But having said that, we have to prepare for 6G, like you said. And to prepare for 6G, we have to create an ecosystem that is ready with 6G and yet usable with 5G. 5G. Right? We can't say we are preparing for 6G and forget about 5G. So what comes first is policy and regulation. And this includes finances. 
So this is something we are grappling with today. We are fighting with, with the government on an everyday basis. The reason is that the mindsets are changing from 4G to 5G. Their, their views, they are a behemoth, government is a behemoth. So their views are difficult to change and action. Mindset is changing. Actioning will take some time. Right. But it will happen. The indicators are very clear. Simultaneously, we have to start building up an ecosystem for 6G. And the technical ecosystem starts with standardization. To build standards. And international standards. Not standalone Indian standards. Right? So that is something the government has fortunately realized. That it has to be an international standard and not an Indian standard. Right? We were going that path when we were talking about 5G, I, but fortunately we got out of that. So, the standards, standardization work has started and it started with a bang. For whatever it, it's worth, the roadmap has been laid out. Right? And uh, it'll, it'll get amended as we go along, it'll get modified. That's all right. That is true for anything that, uh, that evolves. What, what has happened so far is that it's a government who's taking the lead, industry is supporting. There is an area where industry has to take the lead and government has to support, and that is applications. Today in 5G, we are grappling with killer applications. Where is the killer application? World over is not there. It was much hyped, it'll come, it'll come. It hasn't come. When, when you say that this is what we are going to use in 5G, you must ask yourself, can you do it with 4G? 90% of the application we are talking about we can do with 4G. So why 5G? Just because the operators haven't increased the tariff. If operators increase the tariff today, half of these applications will vanish. They'll go back to 4G. Right? But startups, the brains of the Indian brains today, they are the ones who have to collaborate with Indian companies to create applications for upcoming 6G. Even if 6G gets delayed, the applications which are created will be workable with 5G, 5G plus. Right? So that is something we have to start with. We haven't started there. The government is doing its job of creating standards, taking it and getting it accepted in international bodies like ITU. But the industry has to build up creation of application, whatever it takes, whether it takes R&D, it takes field visits, whatever it takes, I don't know. That is, that is something which we have to create. And by just setting up few labs in colleges, etc., we are not going to create applications. Applications has to, application will get created when there is a use, where there is a deficit in a daily life which has to be met and which can't be met with the lower generation. So we have to start thinking of that. But the technologists would have us believe that whatever we are saying in technology, that human body will become a sensor, mm. that itself is an application. Is that not an application? Where will it be utilized? Is something that the practical people on the ground have to think. And that is where then the technology teams have to sit down and say, this is the application. And that is where I'm saying the platforms and applications are going to be two separate SBUs. It, it cannot be one. It cannot be one. And we have to embark on that path. India has done well in standards. It is doing well in policies and regulation. The finance policies also, the government has realized to move it in that direction will take time. It, it will move. But what has not been done is deriving applications. That is something which, has, like the, what he said, about using heat for a different purpose as an application. Where it will get utilized in 6G, please go and see what are the features of 6G. Become a techno management manager rather than becoming a technical person, you will find an application. But if you go as a technical person, you will think of what uh, 6G can offer and you will only think of those things. But if you become a manager and know the technology, then you can think of applications. So this is the way I think we are now headed. And if India has to become uh, the leader in 60, like the Honorable Prime Minister said, you have to utilize the youngsters sitting here and ask them to go and see where can we use this on ground. 
we are talking about iot iot and uh, uh, 5g is going to get integrated then only things will work how do we take it to the next step and what are the application is gaming the only application for what we are working i mean a lot of people say gaming gaming okay but that's that's not the answer answer is much beyond that right and we must realize that 5g onwards it is not a human ecosystem we are looking at it is a human machine ecosystem we are looking at and that is a big challenge and a big opportunity thank you sir you know when you said the ingenuity part i i just we hear ki we also think in a we are wired in a different way you know i am sure everyone has seen jugad right india is a con- conglomeration of jugad why don't we do jugad in this as well i think we need to put our minds to that so thank you sir um i will we are out of time well out of time but if there's any burning one or two questions from the audience i'm happy to put that up i know you must be tired for the full day now i'm sure whoever was there right from the morning is probably here from 7:38 onwards but um any question please so you've combined two things together um we have this concept of jugad obviously and the other thing is progress over perfection because if we are perfectionists then in india i don't think so anything will survive but that's my point of view i i respect your point of view you are absolutely right we need to have a full path instead of just leaving it at jugad what is the commercial application how can we create economies of scale so do you have a particular question to any of the panelists or i'll i'll give give me jugad which has survived indian jugad you see in america when you, when you do a pay uh, what is that called paid back call ah uh, uh, call up me call back or something you uh, uh, call back party or something you the the party call pays call up party pays CPT. call up, call up party pays right so the, the indian wine got into a flurry and they came out with a jugad you call it a innovation and they said missed call and nobody pays you see and it has survived it has survived <laughs> yeah so so you had a question <laughs> please i get uh i think us i have been uh, in the industry for now uh, years but last 15 years i have been teaching uh last 6 years i have been teaching high school in academics organization and all these places one of the key areas or one of the key interest from all the audience is what is the key application in science and when i talk about it is useful to agriculture or to buy pharma or other industries one observation is that yes we in telecom we understand that it is very useful to that industry but other industry on the other side who are actually you know beneficiaries are they aware of So in India Mobile Congress or any uh, any of the seminars that I go, it's only telecom industry which is participating in it. I don't see the other industries which are really, you know, users of this uh, technology. Uh, because I live in a conglomerate where there are a lot of you know residents coming from technology backgrounds. They keep asking me, "What five G can do for us?" And majority of them they think five G is an extra data right now. that's one observation that I have so if i may just respond to you sir yeah um very right so i'm from consulting background but i'm a company by qualification so and banya and enterprise so you can tell really imagine how this future works but you are absolutely right when we start talking of 5g one of the things that we want to talk for sector is this is going to be an enabling layer across the region So whenever you are going up a sector program, whenever you are going up a solution program, you have to have this layer as one of the binding factors. But we are not doing. 
So I think this is something I will take up with the case analysis that we must cross pollinate more sectoral participation in IMC. And I think it's fair point. So your point taking second point. No, I let me let me add on to this. Sorry. This has been recognized by the government and in every line ministry a cell has been created to see how 5G can integrate with that line ministry. Okay, now if the line ministry learns, it will get propagated downwards. This is as far as what the government has done. For IMC itself, the minister's uh, directive last year was get in people, get in other industries who can use 5G like automobile. And he was quite uh, perturbed today when he said, where are the automobile people? They're not here. So it's an evolution. If you see this journey of uh, IMC, from where it was and to where it has come today, today's hallmark of today's IMC is not uh, the pomp and show. It is the Indian ecosystem which is manning the stalls. If you had come for the last IMC, it was the MNCs who were visible. Today, there are hardly any MNCs. So we are evolving. Next year you will see more industries coming in. And then when they sit with the technical guys with, from telecom, they will realize what technology can do for them. So th this is something which has been realized both by industry and by, uh, by the government. But things take time to move and this event is once a year. So change you will see, but change you will see after one year. Yes sir, you are saying Even the faculty uh, group, they are also not very clear about what 5G can do in the faculty group. And when we go and, you know, from EGC, we talk about it for a day, they, they are excited, oh, 5G can do this, and then they take it back to the class, right? So, uh, the, out of probably 300 days of intervention, we go and talk about it one day and come back. I am not sure whether the faculties are again taking it back to the class on all the days because we have to keep talking about it because one of the things that I see is that ideas do not work now. Anybody can come up with ideas. If even the students can come up with the new ideas, they are aware of what fighting can do. So for all of them I see is this awareness problem where they still think IT is data rate first you know. 1% or 2% will talk about data, not more than that. Still, the entire audience talks about data. So, where we as industry, where we talk about so many things, you know, we have all the MMTC, URL and C, we, we have so many applications to talk about, but the majority of the audience who could be contributing to it, they are not aware of it. No, sir, I, I, I agree with you. And like uh, the new teacher said, this is the journey. But what I'm seeing as a positive sign is that every year we're spending, we are spending, we two ways of what we did last year, right? So the awareness levels are improving. If you, uh, I don't know whether you part of the, you know, the first uh, keyboard speaker, the big set from Edison, he said the kind of transition that we are making is so accelerated, it's unbelievable. He's saying from now to December, you will add 50 million more users on the 5G infrastructure, which is faster than anywhere else in the world. So, adoption rates are coming up. I guess this evolution of realization, uh, awareness will increase. So, your point is very well taken. I think we need to do more. Um, but yes, it, it is coming up. Yes, sir, please, please identify yourself also. I didn't ask the uh, server, but uh, please, if you can. I am Riyadeh Sanjay Rao sir, Vettel, uh, we will not have a better panel and a wonderful session with the topic which is next. So two questions which I have in mind. Please if you would also like to identify if you want to ask any of the panelists, please call that out. Otherwise, the questions are submitted. Go there and the question is put away. X, S, O, N, C. Sir, first question, just as a thought, is the accessibility. Right now, I'm carrying a mobile. It is like an added thing which is there. In my complete thought process, which has been there, that thing goes out of my hand, it's not being talked about. So, just this is one question. Second one is the advancement we are talking about. 
because we are going in the higher frequency spectrum, higher and higher frequency because we are reaching now multiple gigahertz and everything. We are reading it. And now going back, we say you do yoga, when you say OM, it comes to down. But when we are going up the frequency, is it going to impact the body? And that is the again question related to your advancement and energy. So these are the two questions. What is the first question not understood? The first question is, can I go away with the added mobile which I am carrying? Size is, size, size is decreasing, size is decreasing, yes. So my co-panelists have all already told you that finally you will do away. And it has it has been demonstrated uh, in uh, by Google, by Pichai, that you will not require a device, which is a care. G's uh, will keep coming and going, you know, you can't say that G's. Okay. Okay, okay, and the second, no, he's a military mind, no, he wants it to be pinpointed, so. Okay, uh, and I hope you're not uh, hitting back at me, Rahul. <laughs> no. Okay, the se second point uh, on a serious note is a fallacy. These uh, frequencies which we use are non-ionizing frequencies. You are, you are a uh, very proficient technical person. You know for sure that non-ionizing frequencies cannot harm the body. Otherwise, the sparrows who are nesting on the antennas would have died long back. They haven't. Crows, sparrows, pigeons, they all nest on the antennas. That's the preferred spot. Right? When nothing happens to them. So all this uh, rigmarole of going out and saying that the EMF will kill you, you will get cancer, all those things are vested interests. Either for publicity or for business. And once the fear gets generated in our mind, then we will say, Ki, hum kyu chance le? let's go back. But are you satisfied with low coverage? They say, no, we want the best of coverage. Then why aren't you permitting us to put up a tower? Oh, somebody said that uh, it's a cancer. Ho jata. Minister ne to bola hai na? The minister made a statement that this has been proven scientifically that nothing happens. Then why are we worried about that? You use microwave ovens at your home. That generates much more power. What happens? Has anything happened? There was so much of hangama earlier. Microwave, don't use microwave, it will cause cancer, you will get killed. What has happened? So these are evolving things. People will, will play on a psyche. They will say that this will create a problem. You say that you don't keep mobile phone. Has anybody proven that? Right? Your mobile phone generates more power if it is on the, on the periphery of a coverage of a cell, then what you are receiving from the cell. So why are you carrying a mobile also? Do away with the mobile. And if there are waves going around, EMF going around all over in the, the countryside, so whether you have a tower near you or not, you are exposed to them. What has happened to us? Okay, so as of now, nothing will happen. Who knows in future something may come up, we don't know. But as of now, scientific evidence does not prove it. Yeah.